Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Other Minds and Hands. Today is a special session of Other Minds and Hands. We are joined by a very special guest today, Bear McCreary, composer of the score for the Rings of Power. Bear, good morning. Morning. Yes, and we also have, of course, Maggie, as always. Great to see you again, Maggie. Um, And we also have Philip Menzies, who is the composer on our Silmarillion Film Project, uh, one of my other broadcasts, who has been thinking a lot about scores for the first stage and uh, has many questions he's interested to ask as well uh, about uh, Bear Scores. So, Bear, again, thank you so much for joining us. What we would love to hear, you know, what we love to talk about most is sort of the process of adaptation, thinking about adaptation as a creative engagement with another work. Uh, just, it's so much fun to explore that process uh, in many ways. So, my, my first question for you, because I'm relatively ignorant about the composing side of things, and it seems to me when I think about score composition as a creative process, you know, as, a, as, as an adaptation process, that you are in a, a kind of complicated three-way relationship, right? They're, on the one hand, you're interacting with the screenplay, obviously, um, but you're also interacting, uh, presumably, with the primary work as well. Um, how do you, where do you sort of begin? D- did you start with the composing of particular themes, was that was that sort of where you, uh, uh, you know, as, as as you begin to sort of shape things, did you start with because I know like the uh, the 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 uh, what's it called the the uh, what was released through Amazon Music um, begins with you know some of the major themes, Goadriel's theme, the Numenor theme, right, um, uh, and uh, and those. What uh, is that where you begin? thinking through themes like that? Uh, Well, it's a great question, you know, how adaptation um, changes my job. My job, first and foremost, above all else, is to make sure that every scene that you're watching is emotionally effective and narratively clear. Um, And there's all these, like, layers under the the ice, the iceberg under the water. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's the analogy I'm grasping for. So that um, the more you zoom out, the more meaning there is. So Mm. that theoretically, all that matters is every single scene individually works. We can do that. But then what about, you know, across an episode? Okay, let's have some themes that work. Well, what about across the season? What about across the entire show? That's a lot of arcs. It it is. But then almost like zooming from a a solar system to a galaxy to a cluster to a super cluster of galaxies <laughs> adaptation of a beloved material you zoom out even further mm. because now i'm thinking about the connection that fans have and i i am one um with material i have no control over material that exists that was written decades ago many decades ago with material that is non-musical even right. the original source material, the books. I mean, there's all these um, connective layers and you want to make something that does that primary job. Let's zoom back in. This scene needs to work, but also work on all these macro levels. Um, so uh, yeah, I started by writing themes. I mean, that is the for me the most important thing. It's what I always start doing. Um, I, uh, I did a pilot once, um, uh, like an action orchestral thing. And it was really, really tight. I had 14 days to write two hours of orche- orchestral symphonic music. And I spent six of those 14 days oh. writing the main theme going, do, do, <laughs> no, do, do. I mean, six days. Yeah. <laughs> my, my orchestrators. And the producers are like, bear, when are we going to hear some cues? It's two hours. And I go, I got this, but I can't, I can't move forward. Uh, and, and then I finally got it. Do, 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 do. Okay, great. There. I like it. <laughs> and I wrote 75 minutes of music in like seven days. I did 10 minutes a day armed with the correct thematic material. Yeah. And I knew that. And I knew yeah. that if I just jumped ahead, it would be bad. Yeah, um, I can lock in. On, on a longer time scale, Rings of Power was a, a similar crunch, to be honest, that that I had a lot of themes to write. I had, wasn't writing one. And I just told you a story about taking six days to write one. Um, I had 17 to write, um, 15 of which I wrote before I started footage. So there was a lot on my mind. Yeah. <laughs> so where did you start? 
I started. Remember? I do. I think I started with um, Arandir and Bronwyn. Ooh. I started with them because they were the most immediately accessible. Mm -hmm. um, they needed to have a love theme that was predominantly their own, that mm -hmm. that was neither the sound of the Southlands nor the sound of the elves. They were like their own little thing. So I just to get some ideas going. Um, and I love writing love themes. Cool. So that was my warm up. And in fact, you know what's funny? I wrote a theme and it got me going and then I threw it out. <laughs> it's not what you heard. It, it was, was just a practice theme. It was just your, your dry run. It really was. Yeah. Yeah, and I played it for a few folks, just a handful of people, not even the people who work on the show. They never, the showrunners never heard this. No one's heard this. Uh, but they were like, eh, that first one's not that great. And uh, and then I came back and I think it was maybe the last thing I wrote. Da, 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 da. Ah, it's gold. Um, <laughs> I, I don't mean to brag, but I'm just saying it's like, that's love. You know, you know when it fits. Yeah. Yeah. No, so the, but then the second thing I wrote, which was the entry into the world, which after the warm up, um, I wrote the Casa Doom theme, oh. which, which just like happened. I mean, yeah. I, again, I don't want to brag, but like, I feel like a dwarf at heart. Like in um, God of War Ragnarok that just came out, I literally am a dwarf in the game. Like even they, <laughs> they looked at me and they're like, "That's yeah." Bare. But the Casa Doom thing, I just felt was my entry and it really was like the the sketch that i wrote is almost identical to the track that you guys wow. record that when elrond walks into casa doom that felt really good and then i was off to the races um but uh writing all the themes they they all had to be malleable um because every time i would write something i would get an idea when, when i mean writing two themes that are different is hard you guys yeah. I mean, you know it's like philip knows this that 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 you go okay i'm gonna have a good guy theme and a bad guy theme that's not hard but then you, you write them at the same time and your brain goes to the same tricks but to write 15 that are different and that their variations would be different um it took me weeks weeks and weeks and weeks and i even told the showrunners um once i got going that they would not hear from me they wouldn't hear the themes they wouldn't hear sketches it was just like Bye bye. I'll see you guys in six weeks. Hang in there with me. Um, and they had faith in me, which I appreciated um, because that process, I just needed complete isolation and trust. Because even, like I said, even the theme that I wrote, uh, the love theme that I wrote for Arundir and Bronwyn, I thought it was good when I wrote it. And then when I got to the end, it wasn't. So I had to go back and redo it. Um, Elrond's theme went through a lot of variations. There, um, there were other themes that I realized were cannibalizing ideas. Sure. Elsewhere, so I just had to. It was like spinning plates, you know. I just kept adding plates until I finally, okay, I think I think I got them. I'm I'm ready to start, you know. So after six agonizing weeks, I was ready to start the Rings of Power. It's really <laughs> nice to hear how that lines up with like almost a traditional adaptation process, though. You know, like it, you start with what you know and what feels not easy, but like a well-trodden path for you, but yeah. then your creative spirit gets to take over and then you do get to take it to that next run. So, oh, it's you're fascinating. Teaching, you're, you're teaching yourself mm. language, whether it's in right. words or, or music that works for you. And then you teach it to the audience, you know, and, and, um, and uh, when, when the language is clear, it's, it's like speaking a language. It's, it's like, it's like learning a new language and, and 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 in the case of adaptation it's not always a new language it's a new dialect mm. and in our case the dialect you know was my score so when we go into valinor it's like this is a familiar language it's a dialect you know the dwarven kingdoms even though it you know i i love the contrast with um uh the minds of moria and casa doom from the peter jackson's the fellowship of the ring i mean i'm i'm using some of the same tricks Howard Shore used, but in such a different yeah. way. They don't sound the same objectively at all. But there's a there's a language there that you understand, oh, this one yeah. in a couple thousand years is going to turn into this one. And then there's Numenor, which is a new language. Um, so that was fun. But that was, um, uh, I, I really enjoyed that process. 
That's great. It just means that it fits so well. Like you said, it, that Casa Doom one just kind of organically came up. That because that's what it, I don't know if you guys felt the same. That track more than any felt like it just belonged there perfectly. You know, wow. so so for it to be the same language in your mind or the same dialect makes absolute sense. Of like, mm -hmm. yes, you walked in and there was the sound. And well, what you want in a a theme for projects like this, you want the themes to feel like they are inhabited within the world, that they're part of the world. They're, they're sort of, you know, source music. Um, and, and the themes all reflect the musical iconography of the cultures, uh, whether it's seen in instruments or not. Uh, in the case of the elves, it's very obvious. We see elves sing on at least sort of two occasions. Um, and it's obviously built into the, the source material. So of course, like ethereal vocals would, um, would be part of that. You know, um, and uh, I I I learned that um, from my mentor Elmer Bernstein. I was his last protege. Elmer was one of the great film composers of all time. He, he burst out of the gate in the '50s with *The Man with the Golden Arm*, *The Ten Commandments*, followed it up with *The Magnificent Seven, *To Kill a Mockingbird*, all the way through the '80s when he redefined the sound of comedies with *Animal House* and *Ghostbusters*. Yeah. Um, and then worked in dramas all through the, the 90s and the early 2000s, Far From Heaven. He did work with Martin Scorsese on a bunch of movies. And um, he wrote themes that were like this. And in particular, um, it's like The Magnificent Seven and The Great Escape just feel like, oh, those are old, those are just old folk tunes, you know? Um, but I have on my wall in my living room, I have a handwritten copy of The Great Escape. Um, and the reason I have it up there is... Um, he was going to throw it away. And I was like, can I keep that? <laughs> but the second reason that I have it uh, is I remind myself of this, that John Sturgis cut this movie together and Elmer looked at it and said, you know what that needs? He needs bum, 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 which feels like an old folk tune. But, but yeah. until Elmer wrote it down, it didn't exist. What? And it takes on this timeless quote to the point that I met that theme through The Simpsons when Maggie is in the daycare. You know what right. I mean? And then I'm sorry, yeah. like, you create something that feels lived in. And one last story, and then I'll let you guys ask another question. I do a show called Outlander, oh, which we do, a lot of, uh, we do a lot of folk music, Scottish folk music. The main title itself is an adaptation, uh, a lyrical adaptation on um, the Sky Boat song. Now, the Sky Boat song, the lyrics um, um, originate from the Jacobite era. Robert Louis Stevenson famously rewrote them. That's the ones I use. The melody, nobody knows. The melody's older than the Jacobite uprising. So it's, it's at least 300, 350 years old. But it's, that means it's been, it's stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. For hundreds of years, some variant of da 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 has existed and it's like time tested that that is a battle hardened melody yeah so when i'm writing for rings of power i want to write melodies that feel like that and i and, and i've spent a lot of time thinking about those melodies why 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 is the sky boat song why did it survive what is it about that melody like specifically and i try to imbue um da 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 it's part art and inspiration, but it's also like craft. Like there are anthems that are built from these simple, modest intervals that are that are very approachable and singable by by a lot of different people. Um, anyway, that that's what I, I wanted every theme. That was my goal. Every theme in the Rings of Power to feel like, oh, that's been around for hundreds or thousands of years, and we just happen to walk into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're really all like, to... yep, you did it, nailed yeah. it. <laughs> that was the goal, anyway. I don't know that I succeeded, um, but but Casa Doom definitely. I feel really good that it it did that. You know, absolutely, absolutely. I, I I've heard so many people for whom the Casa Doom theme is 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 their favorite in the show, but I would love to hear more about like so when you're thinking. And I, I'd love to push a little bit more on that question of of its of its feeling right, right? Because because again, it's I, I, our focus is on on this process of adaptation, right? So, like 
what kinds of ideas? So let's let's focus in on a particular theme. Uh, let's take the Elrond theme, for instance. Right? Are there are there particular ideas or concepts that you're trying to express there? Like, how is it? How would you describe like the relationship between that theme and that character? If you see what I mean by that question, I do. That one yeah. um, was my biggest struggle, my single biggest really? struggle. Um, and I'll tell you why. Um, and it has to do with adaptation. Um, this is where other adaptations were leading me astray. Um, right. Not criticism. I love the Peter Jackson movies. Um, Hugo Weaving's interpretation of that character and the context in which Peter Jackson framed him yeah. is this ultimate authority figure. Um, right. Not without feeling, but stern. And, yes. and his feelings are inside. Um and uh, in a way, you know, my early drafts were like, were so um, rooted in that. And it just, that's not where we meet him. The joy of the Rings of Power is going to be watching that character emerge. And a similar arc is, is obvious um, with uh, Galadriel. Um, but in a way, like, Elrond is a bigger change than Galadriel. I, to me, I can see in Galadriel's, uh, in, in our, our Galadriel's, young Galadriel's eyes, it's like, oh, I, it's it's there, like that right. path. Right. Elrond is, I, so, so in order to do that, I had to go like a step further and I went back to the source material. Uh, especially in the early episodes, I, 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 I had read all the scripts, you know, and I know that his, his brother and his father are alluded to, but they are not the, in the first season, like the the core of the emotion, his arc is with Durin. Um, but underneath that, I thought, okay, let's go back and like, he's a guy who's called half Elven and he's struggling to fit. What does it feel like when your dad is like literally a star and <laughs> right. your brother like founded this mighty kingdom? And and then I looked at that opening scene again, where you know he's drafting some document and the elf, you know, sort of councilwoman comes up or, you know, uh, 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 whatever, a page or whatever you call it. And she's like, yeah, you can't come to the meeting, you know? And it's like, what does that feel like? You know? Um, and yet he, he's still optimistic. You know what I mean? He's, uh, and, and Robert has this beautiful portrayal of him. Then I started thinking like, okay, da, 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 da. It's the optimist. And then it pivots. Da, 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 da. And it ends up on the minor chord of the major tonic where it started. Only for right. one I'm talking about here. Sorry. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, my, but my point is very rarely in popular music that you listen to and in film themes that you listen to is a theme starting in a major key and immediately pivoting to a minor version of that key Never say never. The, the comments will flood with ten examples. I can't think of one off the top of my head. Right. So what that tells you, to me, what that tells you is that like he's he's a little lost. He's not quite sure where he belongs, and then the nature of the theme, the way you know, da 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 da, da. it's about to get minor. Da 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 da. You're like, oh, okay, he's. He's he's moving. He's an optimist. He's right. um, an idealist. Ooh. I that was the click. And for me, J.D. Um, Payne and Patrick McKay were so vital to guiding me on that. I, I can't say I took that journey on my own. Um, they encouraged me to 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 go back and 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 um, you know revisit the books and 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 even like The Hobbit. You know, yes. his his appearance there. It's like it's like oh right, like he's. He is an authority figure, but he's he's very welcoming in when in, in that in that chapter. Um, kind it, as summer, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. and I was like, oh, right. So that uh, that really that really was um, helpful. So that's an example where you know adaptation can throw you off. You mm -hmm. know, like like it was the Peter Jackson films that I just like. Oh, well, obviously Elrond is this, <laughs> right? No, well, he's not. Right. That. He, he'll become that. Yeah, yeah, you're right. There, there are ways. It, it is interesting that um, people who were struggling with the difference between the characters in the show as they are at the beginning, 
you know, the ones like Elrond and Goadriel that we know so well from later on in later adaptations. Goadriel was getting all the headlines as far as like people yeah. people struggling with that. But you're absolutely right. Elrond is just as big, uh, you know, has just as far to go in his arc yeah. as Goadriel does. I know, and I and this is where, um, uh, you know, the the television medium is. It is weird because it's like uh, anyone complaining about that, it, the equivalent is if, now I'm not saying not to complain, go ahead and voice your complaints, you know, but if you watch The Godfather 2 and the first flashback, not even Robert De Niro, we haven't seen Robert De Niro yet. It's young Vito as a boy, a right. sickly boy and he escapes Sicily and he looks at the Statue of Liberty and then you turned it off. <laughs> then said, "What the hell? That's not that's not my Vito Corleone." Right, right. right. Yeah. We know, we know. So, 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 we're with you, man. Like, right. Give us now. But the problem is, in television, Vito Corleone's flashback that you get in Godfather Two is going to take years. years. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, obviously, like, you know, if you're if you're feeling like you don't recognize Elrond, yeah, it might be a while before you do. But, you know, RE adaptation, and now I'm maybe stepping outside my zone because I don't write the scripts, I don't act, I don't shoot, I don't direct. But I'm saying that, like, to me, remember in a film context, when you get the story very shortly, these kind of growth stories are incredibly satisfying. Um, and And we're in the long run. And I, I, as a creator of the show, like, you know, involved with the creators and someone who's making part of it, like, we're, we're aware of that yeah. arc. And, and, and our plan is to satisfy you. Right. That's awesome. Well, one of, one of your um, early interviews, you talked about the structure of, your, of, of the themes. You said uh, there's usually an A section, a B section, an introduction and a development. Was Elrond has a development in his, in, in his theme as well? He he does, although technically it's part of his A theme. Um, what I did is I, I sketched, and then I scored the show. And then toward the end of scoring the show, I went back to my sketches, and I redid them, combining them with moments from the score to create those album tracks. So those album tracks are not entirely standalone pieces and they're not from the show either uh you know for example galadriel's theme i'm gonna get back to your question in a second galadriel's you know what never mind i can talk about that all day so what that <laughs> means though there are little things that i discovered um at the end as i developed the theme so so elrond i've already confessed i didn't get his theme early mm -hmm. in fact this story is fun. I, I didn't play themes for the showrunners. I didn't tell them. And I, I rarely do that. I show them a scene. And it's like, if if Galadriel's theme is doing its job, I don't need to tell you what Galadriel's theme is. You'll know. Right. So we showed them some footage and uh, the scene with Elrond at the end of the, um, we, we we go to the main title, we go to the Harfoots, we cut to, we got to Elrond. And at the end of that scene, they go, yeah, yeah, that's really pretty. That's really nice. That's, uh, so is that an Elrond theme? Does, does he have a theme? And I was like, back to the drawing board. That's all I just said, stop talking. Stop talking. If you like hear what I, what I thought was the theme. All right, so that means Elrond's theme was the last one in. And I wrote it to picture. I was just like, ah, boom, 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 boom. Just let me put it in a picture. So when I came back to do this, the album track, there is a part that is my favorite part of his theme that isn't in the show yet. Because I wrote it at the end. The second phrase, da 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 It's very like Von Williams. It's very folky. That's not in the show. I wrote that like at the end, and I was like, "Damn it!" So that was one of those ideas because, like, in the context of the show, I only needed a first phrase. He did not have a lot of lengthy scenes except with Durin. And those scenes, the, the musical real estate was divided in half. Yeah. And in many ways, their relationship was the Durin theme. And his theme pertained to um, when he talked about his father, when um, Celebrimbor talked about knowing his father, when he said, you know, we say Namarie. Like it was a very 
reserved for like elven stories. So that really meant most of the time that he's on screen, like the Durin theme actually has a lot of, of weight. So anyway, I'm not saying you're never going to hear that end of his theme, uh, but that is one of the things. Um, and uh, there were other developmental ideas that I knew wouldn't be in the show. Um, Elendil and Isildur. Um, that track ends with um, my imagined version of the last alliance of elves and men. This huge, tragic, dark version of their theme. I even saw somebody on Twitter mention it, that it just ends with these ominous, like, bell funereal. Bell calling. Yeah, yeah bell it's like, calling. that's not in the show. <laughs> that, to me, that was a, yeah, that was an experiment to see, like, can this theme that I wrote, which is lovely in these intimate contexts, can it, I just need to put it through its paces mm -hmm. so I know when I get there. Um, so yeah, th th those are wonderful experiments that, that I that I did, most of which I did before I started scoring footage. The Elrond one is the only exception. All the others, I was doing that before I even started scoring the show. I was testing the, um, you know, the, the, the Elendil theme and Isildur theme. I was testing, um, uh, I tested the Stranger, I tested Galadriel, um, and and a few others where it's like, uh, I don't need this in the first episode. I may not even need this in the first season, but I want to know that it's like battle tested, ready to go when nice. I get it. And if it's not, and there were themes that I was like, it doesn't work. Yeah. I, would, I would try it out. It works in an intimate variation, but when I blow it up and make it big, it falls apart. So yeah. redid it. There's like 19 questions I have. I'm like, I every, will, everything I'll going through, I just want to sit with it for a minute. Um, well, I mean, I, I did want to ask just a quick one because you've already brought it up. Your, your process of creating these pieces for a person, a moment, a scene, an episode, a season, a show, and then somehow choosing what goes onto a soundtrack. <laughs> How do you get from that massive picture to what actually goes out to the world as, as a single body of work itself? Well, you make 10 soundtracks. That's the short answer, mm. which is what I did. I made a season one album that is the sort of symphonic experience. The first half is not exclusively the themes, but heavily weighted towards the themes. And in the order in which you meet characters, I introduce their themes. And the second half is weighted more heavily toward cues, but radically trimmed. I really just wanted to show the best of the best. And, um, but I could do that with the confidence that I was also putting out eight other records that, uh, cause there were cues. There were just like moments in some of those. I, as I was putting together the episodic records, I thought, God, am I really not putting this on the soundtrack? Like this is one of the, like, there were some action cues with Arondir, uh, in the trenches in episode three. Um, um, Adar's first cue where we really get her. I mean, there's so many moments and I was like, that has to hit the cutting room floor on the condensed version. And even there were people in the soundtrack community, like at the professional level that were like, the two and a half hour long is the long one. When, when, when are you going to put out the short album? And I was like, that is the short album. <laughs> and, like, and they were like, my, 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 my rep was holding my feet to the fire. He was like, you can't, you can't do that. And like, I, just, I, I, can. I was basically like, hold my beer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have yet, I have yet to see a complaint that it's too long. No, um, no one has but, that. But, but I had confidence going. Anyone who wants to hear the individual episodics, I'm proud of them. I'm proud of every cue. I, every single cue, I wrote myself. I put my heart and soul into it. I, I shaped it. I made it everything I want as a fan. And so I knew that because Amazon was going to let me put those out, um, that I could be brutal on the cut down. And then I mentioned 10, the vinyl is another experience. I mean, even two and a half hours on vinyl, it's like, it'd be literally heavy to carry yeah. that vinyl set. So we did a, I did a, ultimately the the truly symphonic kind of, yeah, I think it's like 60 minute cut down is, is, is coming out on vinyl. But I had the confidence knowing I had all those formats. Yeah. And we're in a digital era where people can pick and choose if they want. But that season one album, I was really clear with Amazon that comes out first. 
and I worked with the showrunners to make sure there were no spoilers in the titles. There were no spoilers in the music. Eagle-eared people might even notice there were certain lines that I omitted from tracks at the end of the record. I just took out a, a solo that put one character's theme on top of another. I was just like, not going to go there. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, the fact that I made it that experience that is condensed and it came out early for anyone who wanted yeah. to hear it before. Um, and I was thrilled that all the creatives in Amazon backed me up on that and, 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 and put it out early so people could experience it. I mean, I, I take soundtracks very seriously. No. A lot of thought went into that. Yeah. And it felt like it laid a lot of groundwork for the fan community as well, because the one thing that has not sparked a lot of controversy in the fandom is the music. And it really set the stage for what hey, they could yeah controversy i know avoid that <laughs> but no, one no would... i get it and I, and I appreciate that i mean look i, I was yeah. prepared for anything you know i didn't i didn't uh know what fans were going to think all i wanted to do is write a score that i wanted to hear and i thought i'm a fan like i'm i've i i'm in that community so i just kind of thought if i like this i I think people are gonna like it, and and that was that was my I, I did feel some um, validation, you know. But but ultimately, yeah, I, I wanted to write something that um, that I was proud of. Yeah. Interested. Uh, you did an interview with Austin Wintry uh, a while ago. Um, Austin Wintry is another great composer. Um, mm -hmm. But you he 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 was talking about where things don't align uh, between. Uh, what resonates with the with with the audience and what what resonates with you as a composer and i think about that now you mentioned the venn diagram um which was a really good really good explanation now in this case you said two of two of the uh, aspects were the the size of the project and the reach now you've got you can't get any better than this in size and reach do you think has there been an alignment between what resonates with you and what res what's resonated with the audience? Uh, I don't know. Let me put it this way. I'm going to bounce that out to you guys. Uh, very rarely in my career can I privately amongst friends point to a thing that I wrote the score in and take ownership of within a rounding error of everything. Mm -hmm. Now, this is my industry. Jerry Goldsmith famously loathed what Ridley Scott did with his music for Alien until he started getting awards and nominations for it. Then he was like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, that was, that's what I did. You know, <laughs> we, we, we get credit for crafting the melodies and we are part of the filmmaking process, but we are also ultimately um, not the final say on anything. So um, anytime that, you know, I see a fan you know, criticize something I did. It's like half the time I'm like, yeah, I know. I, you know, I, I would have done this and they wanted me to do that. Y you know what I mean? Like, like, like in Godzilla, King of the Monsters, do you think I didn't want to use the Mothra lyrics? Like I decided not to? Of course <laughs> not. Like, interestingly, funny on that, we, we couldn't get the rights to the lyrics. And I got, uh, I got the um, classic Godzilla theme and we used the Mothra song, which was famously sung. Uh, and so the, the director and I conspired and I was like, you know what we're gonna do? I'm gonna set it in the same key and tempo as the original recording. And then the director was like, there'll be a fan mashup on YouTube within minutes. Yeah. Of the <laughs> and yeah. it was true. Yeah. Exactly what happened. That's great. You know what I mean? But that's why when fans are like, what the hell, man? How come you didn't use the lyrics? It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The reason, I bring that up, the reason I bring that up is it rings a power, you know, then there's the other side where, the, where there are things that don't have as big a reach, but like I have complete ownership of um, Masters of the Universe, Revelation, Kevin Smith, let me do whatever I wanted. And that score, I was like, damn, that that is my score. Like I have 100 percent ownership of it. Um, the reach was small. Do You know yeah. what I mean? So um but strong. I mean, that's still a really, I don't know, a valuative audience. So that's awesome. Exactly. You got to do exactly and, and what you wanted to do and have it be that positively received. More often than not, m the history of my career is a reach that's small music that I'm proud of. I'll take it. I take the yes. win. I mean, my first job as a child, I mean, I was 24, but I'm a child is Battlestar Galactica. 
I mean, that sets the template for being able to do something interesting. It does resonate with people and it gets cult and award recognition, but it, it like in terms of viewership, it barely survives. You know, it, it, um, anyway, that, that's like the mold of my career. Um, and, and, and indeed, like, I think a lot of things kind of fit that mold. Not all, you know, but, but Lord of the Rings was different. And even as I went into it, I thought, okay, I'm going to give them my all. I'm going to come to this and write the kind of score that I, I mean, I, I come into every relationship like this. Like, I'm just going to give you exactly what I want. And then you have to prove to me that you are a collaborator that can handle that. Everybody says they want something daring and interesting and and melodic and memorable and bold. It's like, it's great. That's like, that doesn't mean anything to me to hear you <laughs> say that. Right, right. You have to let me write that or not note it to death. It's like the death by a thousand cuts that is often my job, which again, not a criticism when that happens. Yeah. Great scores can come out of that experience. I had, I had a, a rough couple of years on um, The Walking Dead. Um, because it was a tricky show, but at the same time, like I'm still super proud of that score and that title. So uh, there's just different paths. Sure. I come into a job. It's either going to be like, um, like a bit of a boxing match, like try this, ah, no, try this. Or it's going to be, I'm going to come in, I'm going to pitch you the A plus version of what I want. And then you are going to help me make it better. Mm. Kevin Smith did that on masters. And JD and Patrick did that on Lord of the Rings. The score is better because of their notes. They had insightful notes, thematic notes. I already said that they didn't recognize my Elrond theme. That means you guys wouldn't have either. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? They, they had my back and it made me a better writer. Right. The fact that the Venn diagram that you talked about, you know, that, that like that Venn diagram of you get those kind of partners, you get to write what you want. There's actually four you get the resources to realize it in the way that is the A plus version. Then uh, it goes to a wide audience and then it, they like it. That's, I want to say once in a lifetime, but it's extremely rare. Now, I don't know about that last one. I, you guys tell me, I mean, is it resonating with people? I mean, do people, did it, did I fill in all the pieces in the Venn diagram? I mean, I certainly, my experience has been that, you know, not only with my own experience with the show, but uh, conversations with people, um, you know, definitely that it has been resonating uh, with a lot of people. Um, and I think it's, I am going to be so fascinated to see, to watch the development of this. I'm fascinated by the scope of the Rings of Power and um, watching the, uh, you know, the arcs of the story and the arcs of the characters and uh, the development of the soundtrack as you go through, how much, how much do you feel um, like as the characters are going to be changing, right? Especially those themes that are attached to particular characters. Yeah. Um, are you going to be going back and revisiting those, you know, continuing to develop new elements of those, of, of those themes? Like, you know, you talked about the, the bit of the Elrond theme that we haven't heard yet. Right. Um, are there going to be more, you know, sort of bits like that that are still going to be kind of added on or developed, do you think? I mean, a hundred percent. And, and yeah. what I want to be clear is that knowing that that is possible and that the groundwork is there is why I did all the work. Right. Because yeah. if I fail to do that, then I have not only missed an opportunity for effective storytelling, um, but I actually think the show would suffer. Mm -hmm. If you get to the end and whatever Elrond's last scene in the Rings of Power is, and you don't hear some connective tissue in whatever transform formation of da 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 da, then yeah. I will retire from film music. Like that's <laughs> what right. I am supposed to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's and, and uh, that is why those themes had to be so strong and so unique and so distinct. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, that's why I, I already mentioned my mentor, Elmer Bernstein. I mean, it's like Jerry Goldsmith, I've mentioned, uh, John Williams, um, Basil Polidorus, Ennio Morricone, 
um, Nino Rota, I mentioned the Godfather, but I mean, shout out to Nino Rota for, for <laughs> kinds of incredible, strong themes. James Horner is another name that comes to mind. Um, the, that's where I modeled all this stuff after, you know, and, and of course, a shout out to uh, Howard Shore, you know, for his work. Um, uh, but there's more of this transformation coming than... Yeah many people have to do for example how uh, uh howard shore did one in, in um two towers the elves show up uh at helm's deep speaking of adaptation there's an adaptation right. and there's that like elven theme with the brum, 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 like it's a simple clear effective tool to say remember those people there in that beautiful place now they're here in a militarized force. It's like film scoring A plus 101, that's what you do. Yep. And if right. he didn't do that, if he just wrote a new march, that moment, going back to my first point, that individual moment would have been served. Would have been great. But that connected tissue, the zoom out, he was connecting two movies now. Well, yeah. I'm thinking about that kind of growth over, I don't know, what is this gonna take? five years, six years, a right. decade? I, I don't know, the rest of my life? I, I don't know. <laughs> but that, you need that kind of growth and and the, the, the changes that are gonna be coming are really profound. I actually think that the a better example um, might be some of the subtle little tweaks John Williams threw into um, Phantom Menace. I don't know how else to say it, guys. I'm going to cite the Phantom Menace. What a <laughs> like, great example. The but soundtrack he took, is brilliant. I mean, the soundtrack is, is really it, good. It is brilliant. I mean, and my, you know, like, Duel of the Fates is on oh. my sleeve. <laughs> like, yeah. But, you know, that little, little, little harp, major key version, a harp representing a little child of the Darth Vader theme. I mean, I get chills even talking about yeah. it. But mm. that kind of thematic transformation where you can really go from good to evil and 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 clock that you know that's why I am so clear on my thematic writing and 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 look I mean cards on the table everybody that I've cited is way more subtle than I am <laughs> like I saw somebody like on Twitter that was like they heard the Galadriel theme 18 times in the first episode like complaining and I'm like only 18 you know <laughs> like like my long game here yes it's like, yeah. like when you watch Indiana Jones we all know that theme it's awesome outside of the main titles how often do you actually hear the Indiana Jones theme like I'm going to spitball 5 to 8 maybe 10 mm -hmm. at the most mm -hmm. yeah probably closer to 5 um, but again, this is the difference between movies and TV. I mean, I this is where it is cinematic can get you in trouble. My score is not cinematic in that regard. Yeah. Because we're juggling all these stories, intercut, we're playing the long game, and I am teaching the audience what these themes are yeah. so that I can deviate from them. I can darken them. I can change them. I want this... I'm doing this because I love it, but it's also, I think, for a story that this layered and interwoven, it's it's a necessary um, storytelling device to have themes be this, you know, over. So uh, we'll see. I mean, I might go down in history as like the most obvious thematic film uh, <laughs> composer of all time. Or it's, you know what I mean? Like, like, there's just not another example that I can think of that um and and you know what if that's a, i'll weather that criticism yeah right you know what i mean like no uh no shame there that is my yes. design and it's my choice and yeah. i i love it and in the long run i think it's worth it well we've yeah. talked then loads you've emulated, this... oh, sorry go ahead, go ahead you've emulated howard shaw in that respect <laughs> he was, absolutely because, yeah and 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 that is also i think it's just different because the it feels different because in those movies their structure is a little less intercut you get these big mm -hmm. chapters whereas in a story in, when you're telling three or four stories in an hour you're going to get you're going to cut back and forth more quickly and when you cut back and forth i'm helping you transition so we cut from casa doom to nori and it's like 
Dun, 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 da, 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 dun. Yes, yes, I'm gonna do it. But yeah, you're right. I mean, that is, and and I and I and I thought about the the language Howard Shore used, and the other thing he did. In a way, his score was was very subtle, but in another way, it was like not subtle at all. Every scene had the weight of this massive orchestra behind it. Well, even if it was just a simple little chorale, it was huge in its scale. And that's why I mentioned in the Venn diagram the resources. because That's rare. Um, it's a trick I've used all the time in television. You have an A orchestra and then like a, a B orchestra and like half the score will be the B orchestra, which is like smaller in size, sometimes massively smaller in size. I did a... Um, a great fantasy show called um, Da Vinci's Demons, where we did this. Um, and to a degree, Outlander used to be like this. We've gotten more orchestra now. But it's like, I always, um, that's how you can tell if a show really has budget. Don't listen to the main title. Pick some random cue with two <laughs> people talking in the third episode. And if you hear like pads and synths, that's a normal TV show. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. That's a normal TV show. And yeah. for this, it's like you are going to hear a hundred piece orchestra at Abbey Road or Air Studios in London on the smallest, okay. most throwaway scene in this show. And yeah. that's why I put that extra effort into it. And I thought about because yeah. he would do every scene in, in the Lord of the Rings movies had that gravitas. And it it added to the operatic quality. People use the word operatic a lot. And I think that's partly why. Yeah. You yeah, have so, that scale and you're allowed to have yeah, that scale. And exactly. you know, one of the things we talk about loads in this and in our studio show Rings and Realms is the foundation laying of season one. And yes. it's so nice to hear that in the same thought as, as the music, because that's absolutely what you would need to do. If you're going to have this big of an arc and this much character growth, the music would absolutely need to grow alongside that character. So that foundation laying and making us forcing us to learn those themes so we understand the next era of growth. Yeah, I think that makes absolute sense and and it worked. I'm on board. <laughs> yes, actually, and, and a follow-up question about Howard Shore because obviously, um, you know, obviously the Peter Jackson films are sort of looming behind, you know, any kind of further, ad, you know, visual adaptation of the, of the you know, the uh, Tolkien's material. And the show has been engaged with that at various points. I mean, we can see many different instances of them interacting with the Peter Jackson adaptation, specifically in addition to the Tolkien source text. For you also, I mean, Howard Shore's score is just so iconic. Um, and I, so I have to imagine that that also has been kind of you know, sort in in some ways, looming behind the work that you're doing. Uh, can you t talk a little bit more about that sort of relationship as you approached it? Absolutely. Um, the short answer is it wasn't. Okay. It didn't loom at all, okay. and I couldn't allow it to. Right. If I woke up in the morning and said, "Today, I need I'm scoring a scene with some Harfoots, and I need to write a theme." that is as beloved as the Shire theme at Howard. <laughs> right. I would then crawl back under the covers, <laughs> crawl in the middle position, I wouldn't get out of bed. I am not served by that. I am not serving you guys mm -hmm. by that. Um, and for me, Howard's work is in that list of people that I want to honor. Mm -hmm. But truly, it was, he was among my heroes on that. He, uh, uh, James Horner and Basil Polidorus were on my mind as well. Um, and, you know, Jerry Goldsmith. I mean, I just, I mean, and and for me, I can like, you can break apart my score and it's like, again, I'm, my homages are quite obvious. Uh, I, I think that it's like, you know, Casa Doom, it's like Basil Polidorus. That's my like, what would it sound like if Basil wrote that? And Numenor, it's like, that's Jerry Goldsmith. That is Jerry Goldsmith in 1996, you know, and <laughs> like, like first night and um, the 13th warrior, like Jerry, yeah, 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 yeah. massive. He would use the mummy. He had this, he would just like barf out great theme after great theme. And then he, we're all in Jerry Goldsmith's shadow, Howard included. 
You know what I mean? So Howard is continuing this tradition and I wanted to write a score I was proud of. And for me to do that, um, it was almost like getting out of my own way, getting out of my own headspace was the most difficult thing. At the end of the day, I did sort of have to throw my hands up in the air and go, if, if I ask myself, all right, I finished this sketch. If I even ask myself, is it as good as Howard Shores? Are people gonna like it? I would throw it, I would go delete. <laughs> so I really, you know, and I knew that Howard was gonna be writing our main title. So I was keeping like emotional space, knowing that that box is gonna be checked. I don't have to sound like Howard Shore. I don't have to compare to Howard Shore. Howard Shore is gonna take us into our show every week. Like in a way it was pressure off me, you know, to know that like he is gonna welcome us back into like the vibe of the Peter Jackson films and, and he's gonna bring a melody that like is gonna be his. It was very liberating to me. And I, and I spoke with him a few times during the process, which was wonderful. He was very supportive and inquisitive. Um, but yeah, it's almost like just to, you know, cards on the table, like any idea that a shadow was looming over me would make me write worse music. You know what I mean? Right. In yeah. a weird way, <clears throat> that really hit me on the red carpet when everyone started asking me that. Uh -huh. I was like, oh God, you know, you're right. But, but the truth <laughs> is, I am such a fan of those movies. And I'm such a fan of what Howard Shore did that to me, I knew my standard was just brutally beyond what what fans are. And I truly thought I can probably write something that some fans will like, but for me to write something that I like, like to me, I'm so I'm I'm cruel to myself, you guys. Like, like I knew if I just focus on that, like I want to write something that I'm proud of. I feel like fans will like it. And truly, if I'm proud of it and it's and it sticks the landing for me and fans don't like it. I can just look him in the eye and say, you know, I'm sorry, it doesn't work for you, but like, that's the score I wanted to make. So that's a part where like adaptation and like the pressure of, of what came before can help you and inspire you. I was inspired by Lord of the Rings, but in a certain way, I also had to be like, I got to detach from this now sure. because today I am waking up and I'm writing a theme for Galadriel. And, and in a way, like I already told you how thinking about Elrond from the movies just threw me off. Yeah. Right. Not, me being a fan did not help. Right. Till I was able to like crack the code and then circle back. Right. Are you getting like angry comments about this right now? I hope I'm no. not. <laughs> no, it's, no, it's a lot of curiosity and passion. So you're good. Don't worry. All right. All right. I mean, yeah. it's just, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a, it's a fun one, you know? And, and obviously like the Howard Shore part of it is, 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 is wonderful. Like I love that he's involved. And, and if you could have told me 20 years ago, I was I was watching those movies multiple times in theaters. I was watching the director's cut over and over. I devoured those uh, the appendices. I watched them as much yeah. as possible. I wanted to find people like that. I mean, I was I was I was in my early twenties, and I thought like, oh my god, well there are other people like me out there. These these people are all insane. Hi, exactly, that's they're all yep. exactly. <laughs> uh, so, uh, if you had told me then, hey, you know what? you're going to get to talk to Howard Shore one day. I would have been like, what? You're going to get to talk to Howard Shore about writing Lord of the Rings. I would have said, wow, are you serious? You're going to get to talk to Howard Shore about writing Lord of the Rings because you're writing <laughs> the second age of Lord of the Rings. I would have been like, Psh. I mean, yeah. just, wow. You, you know what I mean? Like that yeah. is literally a dream come true. Or the only reason it's not a dream come true is who would bother to dream that? Right. You know what I mean? So yeah. <clears throat> it's been a thrill. That's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, you're not the you're not alone in that. Uh, those appendices sparking the passion. We talk about that a lot. Of, a lot of filmmakers. Those are the things that got them into filmmaking. There's no reason it wouldn't get a costumer into costuming or a musician into composing. So that's yeah, awesome. and especially you know, for me growing up in um, a small town called Bellingham, Washington, wonderful town, um, supportive of the arts, you know. But at the end of the day, I was not surrounded by film soundtrack nerds. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was actually through that I met Elmer through through my hometown, and even as I came to L.A., like I I I mean you know it's I guess I, in life we struggle to find those people that are our people, um, and when we find them we 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 want to keep them close. I mean that's I think that's something we can all relate to, um, but I definitely 
thought when I saw those appendices, it is possible to assemble people like that on mass around some singular goal. And I, cause I, I thought like that, that's what I want to do. You know, I knew I, I, I've known I wanted to write film music since I was five, but film music, you're a bit of a lone wolf. And it, I guess, you know, really it's worth saying that like discovering the Lord of the Rings movies, the appendices, Howard Shore, all that was later in my, in my life. Uh, it was at the point when I wasn't just a fan, I was in Los Angeles. I was right. pursuing my craft. So in a way, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I mean, I liked Howard's music before. Silence of the Lambs is awesome. <clears throat> but you, if, you, if you had asked me, you know, in 2000, who writes the best melodies in film music, he wouldn't have been on the list for me. It would have been James Horner, Andy Morricone, John Williams, Danny Elfman, Basil Polidorus, Alan Silvestri, blah, blah, blah. Then Howard comes out of the gate, bam! Yeah. Right. So he really, for melodies, was not my, like, as a kid, I grew up worshiping him. It was like, as a professional, I looked at him and thought, oh my God, like, he's doing that. I want to do that. You know what I mean? And so in a way, like, Howard was at this, those movies came out at this perfect nexus for me. I was still essentially a child. And I was taken up in the wonder of Middle Earth in cinematic form, but I was also had just moved to LA. I was graduating college. I just met the woman I was going to marry. I was looking, I was um, working for Elmer Bernstein as an assistant, looking for filmmakers, wondering if I would find a place in the industry. Do you see what I'm saying? How like, so the Lord of the Rings were very special for me. In a way, they were that transition from just loving something as a child to looking at it as a as a professional and 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 aspiring to it in a very direct yeah literal way. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I gotta say also on that note, I, I was at the, the God of War Ragnarok rap party and this guy comes up to me last night. I wanted to say, I don't know, a child. He he was maybe 20. He looks like a baby to me now. But he starts talking about Battlestar Galactica and he says uh he goes, I, I watched it in 2014. So he watched it five years after it ended. And he watched it in middle school. <laughs> and I was like, wow. Wait. Wait, you know what I mean? And I, I, the reason I bring this up is that <clears throat> the movies, the Peter Jackson movies, in particular, just Fellowship of the Ring, you know, we're, we're 20 years out. Mm-hmm. 20 years. Yeah. And so another question you guys have not asked, but I'm going to answer <laughs> is, uh, the thing I think about, the people that have never watched those, and there's a lot of them. I mean, I hate yes. to I hate to say it on this Zoom. There's a lot of them that are going to find the IP through Rings of Power, and then they're going to go to the movies, and then we want them to go to the books, and that's a wonderful thing. So the whole thing about the shadow of like Peter Jackson movies, yes, they cast a shadow, but the truth is, to younger people, they don't. You know, I feel like it's not like I'm in the shadow of those movies. I'm the baton has been handed to me and I take it very seriously. It's it's dear to me. It's like a a privilege. Mm -hmm. I'm passing that baton on to younger people that I'm and I'm saying, like, go watch those movies. Yeah. Go read those books. You know what I mean? And realizing that even I I think of myself as like an upstart kid who's just getting started, but I realize like Battlestar Galactica is 20 years ago. Right. The, The the pilot was 2003. Like, even now there's people coming up to me saying like, I watched your thing in middle school and it moved me, you know? So I'm, I'm recognizing we all have just this role to play and we're passing the baton of what, what we love. And it's that love that keeps me going, you know? Uh, that's what I, 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 I love seeing that from fans that are, that are able to see that. That it's like adaptation is change. Adaptation is love. Adaptation is giving something to a new generation that would otherwise not have it, mm-hmm. you know? And and especially for me as a, as a like now mid-life, mid-career person, I'm like, I'm seeing that even with stuff that I worked on, you know? There's gonna be a reboot of Battlestar Galactica and I probably won't be asked to score it, you know? It's like, that's, I hope, that, I hope they do with that what I did with Rings of Power. <clears throat> No, that's great. Um, yeah, so I, I want to think you were talking about, you know, people going back to the books and stuff. 
are there other places in your score, other other you know of of your themes or whatever, um, where you felt particularly inspired by something straight from Tolkien, either one of, one of Tolkien's themes or ideas or uh, or scenes or anything? I mean, you, I mean, you you mentioned going back to to to, to Tolkien at, at many points. Yes, I mean, I I needed to reconnect with the source material because I'm getting a sense of the big picture here. Right. I I started with the first episode in the first scene and I went to the end, but I I had to know even when I started that where we're going. What does this mean? You know, and and what does it mean in the context of our show? Um, <clears throat> and and so there were there were many themes that were sort of like indirectly um, inspired. Um, but I'm also always on the lookout for um, text. I mean, like mm -hmm. the, the source material is text. It implies music. It, it has text. And and I um, uh, am earmarking text that I, I want to use. Um, so in fact, I, I think that it was, you know, I got hired very late in the process um, on, on the first season. Um, and <clears throat> obviously, well, maybe it's not obvious. Uh, the ring poem, the ring verse being put into music. That was like my first idea. We must do this. Uh, and and so, you know, in a way that was like the warm up for me. That it's like, let's take, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say the most famous poem. I can say that, right? It's the most famous poem in the books. Yep. That's not controversial, he said. But anyway, <laughs> I think it's the most famous one. Yeah. And let's put it in the music. You know, let's put a theme uh, <clears throat> based on that. And I love there was um, there was a fan who figured it out because we didn't release the lyrical version till very late. Mm. Yeah, was, but somebody figured out they're like da 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 da. It's like three rings for the elven kings under the like. It was so obvious <laughs> that was a vocal. All those repeated notes like. That's a vocal melody. You know what I mean? I, I, I loved it. Um, I want to do more stuff like that. I mean, I want to go deeper into the text. There's, um, you know, a lot of fans have asked why there's no theme for Gil Galad. Mm -hmm. And it's like, give me a beat. I got an idea. You know what I mean? Like, there, there, there are places where I, I really do want to go back to the text and, and, and bring out. Um, mm. uh, and you, you will definitely hear more of that in the future. Right. And that's kind of cool to hear because that's one of the ones we've talked about. This isn't the Go Gallad we know. We don't feel like we've started his arc yet. So to have the music, music kind of feel the same way. Uh, absolutely. And it's I also. a little validating, not going to lie. <laughs> I, I also, yeah. and, I, and I also just had to be a, be a realist that it's like every realm got their anthem. You come into Casa Doom. You know, even the orcs got one mm -hmm. for the purpose no, 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 of season. No. Yeah, exactly. For the purpose of season one, there really was no place to do that for the elves. And of course the elves are a complicated society. You know what I right. mean? Like, I can't, you know, would they even have one anthem? Well, that's, for me, the break there was like, it's Valinor. Valinor, the Valinor theme is where I'm establishing the elven musical language. But for season one, you know, Lindon requiring its own theme, there was an establishing shot, but it's like, that's Elrond's moment. I can't. I can't really do a thing. Right. Um, so it's sort of like those moments are coming later. You know what I mean? That yeah. that's partly where like the storytelling. I could have done that, but then it would have just been complicated for the sake of being complicated. So that I could sit here and say, "Ooh, there was a there was a theme for the you know the elves that that is going to come back later." But it's like ultimately, if it's not emotional, it's not meaningful for me. And Valinor did get the best introduction of all of them. You know, Casa Doom, I got this great 30 second entrance, same with Numenor, but we had, you know, three minutes, four minutes to enter into um, Valinor. And most notably, the first thing you hear is, is, is the first thing you experience is the Valinor theme. You're looking at a black screen mm -hmm. and, and I have a chance to quote a theme. Yeah. So that's gotta be a big one. You know, it's gotta be, mm -hmm. so, so that's just sometimes where the, um, I'm not saying we won't have a theme for the el the elven sort of realms and, and the sort of geopolitical um, elven communities. It's very likely that will evolve. But for season one, I was like, let me let me keep it in a in a in a in a 
format that's emotionally effective for the story that's being mm -hmm. told. And the way that that was bookended in, in, in episode eight, it was so obvious that like yeah. the Valinor theme, you know, and that's something all the elves share. I mean, that right. even I think in the context of the source material, right? Is yeah. it, it connects, it clicks. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Um, that leads me, well, what I want to ask about next, knowing, not trying to pump for spoilers or anything, but uh, it, it, whatever you could tell us about, you know, what you're thinking about in season two and the kinds of, uh, you know, the kinds of things you are, you know, anticipating or looking forward to. Uh, I'm anticipating having an incredible experience and looking forward to that as well. There are many things that I, I mean, in, in beginning to score the first episode, I had lengthy conversations with the showrunners about the entire mm -hmm. soccer to unfold um and and some of my my favorite things are are in are are, are coming soon sooner than later mm -hmm. uh, and uh yeah i mean i'm 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 excited to expand the palette let me put it that way that like i spent six weeks writing 17 themes and in many ways <clears throat> these are going to be involved taking us to the end um but under no circumstance am i done writing themes. Right. I am not even close to being done writing themes. And there's major musical R&D that I'm now involved in um, for the second season and beyond. Um, and I'm excited about that. I mean, I, you know, I always, you know, I already mentioned that if you compare this to The Godfather 2, you know, story-wise, let's compare it to something that is closer to home. Let's compare it to the Lord of the Rings trilogy. In terms of how far we are through the story, we just got to the end. We just got to Elrond's house. We are not yet at the Council of Elrond, you know, where book one in Fellowship breaks. That's right. where we are. And yeah. again, you wouldn't read up to there, close the book, and then start complaining about all the things you didn't get. Because it's like, it's coming. You just, you know, you spent 100 pages in the Shire or whatever, 75 pages, you know. Like, so knowing that it's like, I mean, for me, when I'm reading like the Council of Elrond, it's like stuff starts to just crackle. That's when you start turning the pages, you know? Yeah. We're getting to that, you know? I am I am excited and, and admittedly a little terrified. Like truly, I, I, I was in this very naive place in season one, but the shadow that I'm under now, everybody, is my own. Suddenly I'm like, oh my God, like, like, did I write the best 15 themes I'm ever gonna write? And now I gotta write, I gotta write a new one that like slots in with those. Like, oh my God. Um, it's exciting though. I'm, I'm really this. excited, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. But yeah, I'm not, not gonna lie. It's, it's different this time around. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a challenge. Well, good stuff mm -hmm. comes from fear. You're gonna be fine. <laughs> I agree, the adrenaline is pumping, you know? Yep. That's awesome. I feel like I'm asking a lot of questions, but I, one came up in the chat that I'm, I genuinely think fits in well with this too, if you don't mind asking, but there was a, a question about how you developed the Halbrand and Sauron music, knowing right. that that character was going to pivot and not letting us know that too early. That's a good one. And I got about five minutes left and I'm- gonna Yeah, yeah, I know. We're, yeah. So check it out. All right, so we're in spoiler territory, Halbrand and Sauron needed to have a musical connection that is obvious when you have certain information and is subtle enough that hopefully you, you won't pick it up. Um, but I use a technique called um, retrograde. So one theme is the other one played backwards. And then I made, I made a couple little alterations, one in the rhythm, very subtle, and one in the pitch, just a half step. So I basically, Turn the theme backwards and went like, boop, Ooh. Boop, just to cover my tracks. Um, but uh, to do that, I mean, I spent a long time on that. Retrograde um, is like speech. I mean, when you, if you record me saying this and you turn it backwards, it would be like, it loses 100% of its meaning. So uh, while the theme is not fully a palindrome, 
it it needed to have a lot of um it 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 i mean god i'll be talking about this forever but i mean it, it has a lot of um patterns in it that are both um horizontal across time vertical across pitch i built in all these things um that that when you flip it around it can still have some meaning um but in short you know i think the thing about sauron's theme everybody else i mean i think quite literally everybody else has themes that leap i love intervals um and in fact i one of the things i was building is that the the second note of everybody's theme has a distinct interval so that in theory you can identify it in two notes da 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 or no da 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 that one's a tough one da 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 the stranger so all right sauron's theme is da 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 da. And then I get a little leap. Da 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 da. Although it still hooks around. Da 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 da. I mean, like, like, you know, it's like da 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 da. I'm just drawing little circles. It's just rings. Yeah. It's just rings and rings and rings and rings. Everybody else. Da 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 da. Like, and I I do this when I listen. It's a Galadriel scoring, you know. Um uh da 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 it's huge. You know what I mean? I love it. So that's a, a clue that like Sauron is different. And it's it's circular. Again, I'm I'm not a subtle or clever man, okay? Like this is <laughs> I mean, very obvious. I but, didn't see it, so the most subtle. But what's interesting though, what's interesting when you turn that backwards, it means Halbrand does not have the leaps. Um um that everybody else has um da, 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 da. and i frame it in a in a sort of emotional chordal mode but it's like da, 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 it it it's different than da, 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 da. you know you know what i mean like to me it's there it's like yeah. he's the only guy whose theme does not leave Why? You know what I mean? And, I, and 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 Adar's theme also shares this characteristic. I mean, if I I guess the headline I should have started with is the more good you are, the more your melody has leaps oh. in it. You know what I mean? And and uh um so I, I there there were similarities. The reason I bring that up is you don't have to be a musicologist to turn things backwards and figure out the code. It's sort of implied that connection is you can feel it. I think mm -hmm. you can feel it. Um, so that uh, that took me a minute. That took me a hot minute to figure that out and make it work because the Sauron theme is one of the most important themes in the show. So is the Halbrand theme. But to make them work as a palindrome uh, was sort of like tying my hands together or like tying my shoelaces together and saying, you still got to run a marathon. You know what I mean? Like right. I set these parameters, but I really, I really wanted to make that. Uh, I really wanted to make that work, and and it worked a little too well. I think some some people did figure it out sooner than I like, but that does. But most people didn't. You know what I mean? Um, and I think it augments your second viewing. I think it. I think it's. I think it's cool. Really yeah. cool. Awesome. Oh, I could also say Corey and I talked about talked about music and Howard's and. The relationship to Howard, but I might also add, never trust the semitone rise, Corey. Yeah, never trust the semitone <laughs> rise. Album, never That's trust it. it. <laughs> In Middle Earth. Yeah. Uh, I even I even noticed that you put that on the word Mordor in where the shadows lie. That yep. semitone rise, beautiful. And it's that resolution from the tritone, Dun! like that. It, it's it has this malice in it the um the melody on uh, where the shadows lie i to me is just one of the coolest because it's so it's just so weird yeah. i remember somebody i saw some some again i think it was being phrased as a criticism but they were like they they thought that the the the, the text the, the song would be more like powerful and like badass and it's which it is i mean it's sauron is like throwing down like look i can release i can do a heavy metal track of that text but in the context of this, please show, do that. I want that. 
<laughs> but in the context of the show, it's 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 uneasy and it's 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 seductive. That's the thing. It's it it mm-hmm. is seduction. I yes. think of the text not it's not to scare you. Yeah. It's yes. to make you want to put the ring on and serve Sauron. You know what I mean? Yes. That it's in a way it's like a it's like a call to arms. It's like it's almost inviting. You know what I mean? It's like a siren song. And then to me the like all those chords, um, uh, you know, where the shadows lie, where it's like, it's weird, but it's, it's beautiful. It's oh, not because it's Sauron's own anthem. Yes. And and I I've always read him as sort of like, this is what I want, and it's better for everybody. I think even in the books, this is my interpretation, that if you if if, if an interviewer went, are, Sauron, are you evil? He'd be like, this is a complicated question. Let's talk about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? like, so so I, I love that i was able to sort of you know imply that also before i go just one other thing that's so cool that theme that ultimately is revealed with fiona apple singing mm. the ring poem at the end to be the theme for the rings a connection to mordor and sauron but you heard it connected to mithril mm-hmm. Pelabrimbor. Yes. like you meet Pelabrimbor and you hear this it's like the harbinger of doom those chords, you hear it over the main title in the first episode. When you see the words, the rings of power for the first time, you hear these two chords, mm-hmm. it's that theme. And and to me, that seduction, that like, welcome to the rings of power. <gasps> Here's Celebrimbor, this is Mithril. Isn't this great? You know what I mean? <laughs> and then it like, those chords you hear at the end with Sauron walking into Mordor, like mm-hmm. that's pretty awesome. I think yeah. that, that, that kind of like, and it's not on the nose storytelling. That is where me. Yeah, I am more clever than I give myself credit for because <laughs> I I had teed it up in this other context, you know. But that's I'm following the the stories, doing this really really cool way of like bringing people in uh, to Sauron's um, journey on this show. It's mm-hmm. gonna be awesome. You, and you yeah. you carried that final scene with just music. There was no dialogue yeah. at all. Credit to them. Absolutely brilliant. Credit to the showrunners for giving the stranger the last line of dialogue in the season mm-hmm. one that fans of the movies recognize and then not saying a word for almost mm. seven minutes and there's serious revelation galadriel makes a sacrifice elrond makes a sacrifice something's on elrond's mind he goes to the river he sees the thing he goes to confront her she looks at him and you could have all this dialogue blah 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 blah. <laughs> and they got rid of i mean they, they planned on not having it um i felt pressure there but i also again i had i had i had done my homework like i knew i had written that ring verse early because i knew i wanted it at the end i yeah. wanted so that you know when she says let's not we're not going to make uh, two, we're going to make three. Um, dun, 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 dun. And now I'm stating it like, even though you haven't heard it except for the in full, except for the end credits in the first episode, it's like I am making clear the way Howard does with his themes. Like, this is important. Pay attention to this. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I I, I love the, the operatic nature of of, uh, of the ending and, and hoped, I hope that I rose to the, to the occasion that the, um, that the showrunners, you know, provided me because that's that's pretty awesome. Awesome. Well, I know you have wow. to run. You've been enormously jet, generous guys. with your time. No, uh, we could do this forever, Barry. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but thank you so much for for joining us. This has been a delightful discussion. It's so fascinating to hear. You know, one thing that that Maggie talks about. So Maggie is the film person. I'm the book person, and. Um, you know, one thing that Maggie is often talking about when we talk about film adaptations is that any screen adaptation is a collaboration of an enormous team of people, you know, who all have this, you know, important creative input uh, into the into the, the adaptation and the production. Um, so it, it's just it's it's just been a delight uh, to get more insight and, and, and hear more from you about this really crucial element uh of the it's, adaptation it's so, many so. Co- so many cooks in the kitchen for these things but it's so nice to hear when that kitchen is a pleasant place to be and that you all work together and you all bring your ingredients and you know it, it just sounds like such a collaborative gorgeous process with this it, but... it was the best kitchen i've ever been in wow. i mean and, and and uh that's extraordinary that actually 
for me, there were very few cooks in, in the kitchen. And that's a testament to the Amazon and the showrunners creating these bubbles. Because truly, to get the best work out of anybody, you give them clear direction. You pick the right person with the right instincts, who has a good work ethic and gets along. You give them clear direction. You get the best work out of them. But micromanaging them, I mean, if you have to start beating them up with notes, and you, you it's, like an, it's like casting the wrong person. Yeah. You know what I mean? So they let me, they brought me on and they trusted me and 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 and, and that's incredible. Awesome. I also just wanna say, you know, to the fans, I just wanna say like, I appreciate all of you guys. Um, and uh, I feel like I am one of you. And, um, you know, I'm on social media. I'm not going anywhere. If you tag me, I see it. Um, and if you're rude, I block you. That's it, it's easy. <laughs> if you're not rude and, and, and have questions and, comments and and whatever like i'm i'm here and i'm not going anywhere oh. so i love interacting with you and i love that positive energy and the 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 passion and the 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 questions and the curiosity um so i just wanted to thank you you know um all of you watching this are like the people i love interacting with uh online so you know i just wanted to say if i don't i i know i've tweeted this once i'm just so grateful for the, the fan community that's that's out there um, uh, embracing or curious about mm -hmm. the ring. I mean, that's yep. uh, that to me is wonderful. I love nerding out about this stuff with, with all you guys. So, you know, you guys know where to find me. I'm on all the socials. And I also just wanna say, keep an eye on my blog. Mm. I'm next year releasing substantial blog entries for every episode. I'm going to go, People are asking, what is the text in this scene? What is, you know, mm, mm. I'm awesome. I, I'm going way, way in depth. I mean, I've already posted four blog entries and they were like the appetizer. So keep your questions coming. There are people that ask me stuff on Twitter because uh, I've already written my blogs. I'm just releasing them uh, later next year. Mm -hmm. And I go back and I go, you know what? I didn't answer that question. I'm gonna go back in episode three and add a little paragraph. So anything you guys wanna know, Cool. Hit me up on social media. I'm, I'm, I want to, I want to answer. I feel awesome. like we've just created a new series. We're gonna have you on eight more times to go through. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be, it'll be interesting to come on again after a few of the blogs have come out. Because cool. I, I, I'm going as deep. I feel like I'm James Cameron in the Marianas Trench. Like, this is the deepest it goes. I'm at the bottom. <laughs> but I'm curious if you guys go, no, 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 no. What about that? What about that? You know, like there might still be more. I mean, I yeah. mean, it, 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 there really might. There's a lot there. Awesome. Um, but anyway, all that's to say, like, I love I love what I do. And I love <laughs> getting tell. to be a part of it. And I love sharing it and, and talking about it. And, and uh, yeah, let's keep the conversation going. Awesome. Very good. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, right. We're going to, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll sign off now. Uh, I know we, we could keep you talking for a really long right. time here, but uh, yeah. anyway, thanks again for joining us. Thanks everybody uh, for watching today. Uh, we appreciate you as always, and we will be back again next week. Thanks everybody. Thanks yeah. again, Bear. Really appreciate Thank it. You.